Well, good day, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar entitled USDA Funding for Telecom Infrastructure, the Substantially Underserved Trust Areas, or SUDA, initiative, and the Rural Utility Service Telecom Loan Programs. My name is Randy Evans, and I will be your host for today's webinar. Our presenters today are Jessica Maylander and Laurel Laverier with USDA's Rural Utilities Service. Before uh, we introduce today's presenters and before they begin uh, the formal part of the program, I'd like to take uh, just a couple minutes uh, and give you a personal introduction and also talk a little bit about uh, the Tribal Telecom Conference. Um, as I said, my name is Randy Evans. I'm an attorney in private practice, and I also serve as the advisory council chair of the Tribal Telecom and Technology uh, Conference. Uh, the annual Tribal Telecom and Technology Conference serves as a gathering place to share information, explore solutions, and to create new possibilities for pathways across the digital divide in Indian Country and to make information and communications technologies accessible to American and Indian and Alaskan Native communities. Key focus areas of the conference include infrastructure, community and economic development, culture, education, and government, and public safety, emergency management, and health. Our fourth annual conference will be held next May, May 4 through 7, 2015, in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And you can get more information about the conference and also register and learn about uh, sponsorship and exhibiting opportunities at the website, which is tribaltelecomconference.com. Um, a little bit about today's webinar and uh, the format. So the, pre the formal presentation will last for about 40, 45 minutes or so. Uh, and then we will have time at the end for a question and answer period. Uh, but if you do have questions throughout the program, go ahead and type those into the GoToWebinar toolbar. And if they relate specifically to something that Jessica is talking about or if you want clarification on any particular point, then we'll go ahead and address those questions at that time. Uh, for more general questions, then we'll reserve those for the Q&A period at the end. So we're very pleased to have uh, presenting today's program Jessica Maylander uh, with USDA's Rural Utility Service. Jessica works in the Policy and Outreach Division of the Telecommunications Programs with RUS, um, and she's been working with that division since May of 2011 as an intern and as an employee since August of last year. We also have on the phone today Laurel Laverier, who will be available to answer questions. Laurel has served as the Operations Branch Chief for the Policy and Outreach Division of RUS since July of last year. Uh, the contact information for Jessica and Laurel, as well as other contact information for uh, RUS, um, will be available at the end of uh, this presentation, the slides, and these will be made available on the tribaltelecomconference.com website. And with that, I will turn the program over to Jessica. Thanks, Randy. Um, hi, uh, my name is Jessica Maylander. As Randy said, I work in the Policy and Outreach Division of the Rural Utility Services Telecommunications Program. Um, Randy, I'm not seeing the first slide of my presentation, so whenever you're ready, you can go ahead and advance to that. There it goes. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about the SUDA, Substantially Underserved Trust Areas, provision, um, which affects a couple RUS programs. Um, this provision was published in the Federal Register on June 13th of 2012 and became effective a month later in July of 2012. Um, there are a couple of online resources, um, a lot of them, in fact, that would be very helpful for people that are just now maybe starting to consider applying with SUDA consideration. We have a fact sheet and a Frequently Asked Questions page on our website. 
Um, I would also encourage people that are interested to read the, the regulation itself. Um, it's fairly short, and if I can understand it, probably everyone can understand it. Um, so it has, you know, quite a bit of detail, and it's not that long. So um, with that, I'm going to try to cover some parts of the regulation, questions, and things like that that you might have. Next slide. Um, so the SUDA um, provisions apply to five programs in rural utility services which you can see listed. Um, I'm only going to be talking about the two telecommunications programs that SUDA applies to. These are the Telecommunications Infrastructure Loan Program and the Broadband Loan Program, which we also call the Farm Bill Broadband Loan Program because it's authorized under the Farm Bill. Um, so SUDA allows the RUS administrator to make a determination to apply any or all of five different possible benefits to people applying for SUDA consideration. Um, the first is to that um, he or she can offer loan interest rates as low as 2%. Um, and uh, so basically, the interest rate offered will depend on what is needed for financial feasibility of the project. So we'll go as low as. Um, is necessary to make the project work. Um, we can also waive certain documentation requirements regarding non-duplication of service. And what that means is that normally most of our programs have a provision that we can't fund projects that overbuild where there is already service. Um, occasionally it has a caveat such as, you know, if you can prove that service is inadequate, um, we might be able to do something about that. But for SUDA specifically, um, it's possible for us to waive that re um, the non-duplication requirement. And that consideration will take into account existing services in the area, um, cost, quality, availability, and financial feasibility of other RUS borrower ability to repay their debt in the applied area. Um, we can also waive matching funds or credit support requirements. So the two RUS telecommunications loans that I'm discussing do not have matching fund requirements, so that particular part doesn't apply. Um, in fact, I don't believe that any of the five loans um, have matching fund requirements, so it would be a credit support requirement waiver. Um, we can also extend the time period in which loans are repaid. So these will, this will obviously take into account the cost of the project, the availability of credit support relative to loan security, and alternatives to the non-waiver. Um, and then finally, we can provide the highest priority for funding to eligible projects that will serve trust areas. So our two loan programs are non-competitive. Um, but we have, obviously, a certain amount of funds. And generally, we allocate these funds as projects come in until we run out. So under certain circumstances, we might be able to um, bump a pseudo loan to the top of the pile, as it were. Uh, next slide. Jessica, we've got a question from one of the participants, and um, if this is something you'll cover later on, that's fine. But the question is if there are opportunities for coordination with EDA funding. Um, I'm not familiar necessarily with EDA funding. What does EDA stand for? Um, I'm not actually, uh, that would be, I guess, the Economic Development Administration, I believe. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, so my answer, without completely being familiar, is that um, there probably is opportunity for collaboration, uh, but you know the SUDA provision is it's what it really boils down to is just um, special terms and consideration for normal RUS loans. So um, it's certainly possible for people applying for loans to possibly to work with economic development groups, even specifically the EDA. But um, I don't know that, again, I'm not really sure if they provide funding or something like that. But there, there is room for um, collaboration. 
Yeah. Well, let's continue with the program, but, um, and I'll just jot right. a note to myself. We can circle back at the sure. end and right. talk about, you know, combining funding because on many of these projects that does become uh, not just important but, but necessary, and so yeah. we can circle back at the end. And, and I actually just confirmed that we can provide a SUDA loan alongside of an EDA grant to help bring down the cost of the project. Excellent. Excellent. Thanks. Sure. Okay, so um, in order to be eligible for SUDA, um, you have to be, your project has to be serving at least in part a trust area, and trust areas are statutorily defined as listed on the slide. Um, they are, it's either land held in trust by the United States for Native Americans, um, it's subject to restrictions on alienation imposed by the United States on Indian islands, including Native Hawaiian homelands, is owned by a regional corporation or a village corporation, or is any island in the Pacific Ocean if such land is by cultural tradition communally owned land. So when applying for SUDA, you'll have to provide documentation that um, the project serves a trust area and how much of the project will serve a trust area. Um, potential kinds of documentation include official maps of federal Indian reservations based on information from the Department of the Interior, trust asset and accounting management system data, which is also maintained by the Department of Interior, Bureau of Indian Affairs, things like that. And we will utilize um, the Department of the Interior, the Department of Hawaiian Homelands, and other resources to confirm that those trust lands are being served. Next slide. Um, so when determining whether an area is substantially underserved, um, there's certain documentation that needs to be submitted along with the application. Um, and this will also go into determining how high need the area is and therefore how many SUDA provisions or in what manner the SUDA provisions are applied. So um, this is at the discretion of the administrator of RUS. Um, and there's lots of suggested documentation in the reg, but this is not um, in the final rule, excuse me. And there's, this is not an exhaustive list, but just a few examples of things that you can submit to show that your area is underserved or has high need. And in this case, when we say underserved, since our loans build broadband infrastructure, you would have to show that your area is underserved by broadband service. So um, this could include data documenting a complete lack of broadband service in the community or inadequate broadband service, or and or data documenting high need in the community in general, such as per capita income, unemployment statistics, and things like that. Um, or a good way might be examples of e economic opportunity which have been or may be lost without improved broadband services. Examples of services that people cannot access easily without broadband. Um, examples of businesses that maybe might leave without broadband, things like that. Um, you're encouraged to provide as much ad additional information as you think is necessary to demonstrate the high need. Um, you know, we understand that sometimes it can be difficult to determine exactly how much you should submit, but we believe that the applicants um, are in the best position to make the initial case that the services are inaccurate. You know um, the area that you're going to serve, what's going on there, so um, you were, we know that you will have the right information to submit to show that to us. Next slide. Okay, so when you're submitting an application for SUDA consideration, um, so the, you have to submit a complete and eligible application within the guidelines of the relevant loan program. So I'm going to discuss briefly our two loan programs at the end and some of the eligibility requirements for those. Um, again, these loans are not competitive, so if you, um, if there's, paperwork that is incorrect or missing, generally we can go back and forth and kind of um, fix things, but you want to make sure usually that you have a complete application and obviously that you're eligible under the regular programs. And then in addition to that, um, we're going to need a description of the applicant documenting eligibility under SUDA. 
which again is showing that you are going to serve trust lands. Um, and also a description of the area to be served. And um, this part, uh, 7 CFR 1701.103, just refers to the section of the SUDA final rule that lists permissible documentation for eligibility. Um, also an explanation of the high needs, which we discussed on the previous slide, and the impact that the specific authorities you're seeking under the SUDA provision would have on the project. So if you are seeking the lower interest rate, you need to explain how that's going to affect your project's budget, timeline, et cetera. And same with all the other provisions you're seeking. Um, in addition, we can request additional information that we would consider relevant to the application, which is necessary for evaluating the application under SUDA. Um, and we can also request modifications or changes, including to the amount of funds requested, depending on how we determine the provisions requested might affect the budget and things like that. Next slide. So based on the information that we get from a SUDA application, the administrator of RUS will make the determine as to what, if any, of the SUDA terms will be used to apply to that applicant. Um, even if the applicant is found to be serving a substantially underserved trust area, none of the authorities in SUDA, in the SUDA provision, apply automatically. Um, any additional considerations, again, are at the discretion of the administrator. And um, if multiple SUDA considerations are requested, some, all, or none of them may ultimately end up being applied to the loan. Next slide. Okay, so these are just um, two big questions that I thought might come up. You can also find these on our frequently asked questions and um, on our SUDA fact sheet. And the first one is, can non-tribal applicants request SUDA consideration? Uh, the answer is yes. Um, you have to be serving, obviously, a substantially underserved trust area, at least in part. And additionally, you must provide RUS with documentation showing that tribes in the service area agree to the project. Hopefully, the reasoning for this is obvious, but um, this you know, can come in the form of letters of support or something like that. Um, SUDA actually doesn't do anything to limit eligibility. So pretty much um, anyone that's eligible for the regular programs, if they're serving a trust area, is potentially eligible for SUDA. Um, however, you know, if only 1% or some really small percentage of the area you're serving is a trust area, it might not be as likely that you would be granted SUDA consideration. It does depend on the individual project. Um, additionally, when you're looking to do a SUDA application, it's really best to get in contact with us early on. I'm going to say, again, that these loan programs are not competitive, so there's quite a bit that we can do in helping put together an application. So um, we have general field representatives. I think we have 27 of them across the country, and they are sort of our people in the states on the ground. So they're usually your first point of contact for any loan, and we have a, a list of all their contact information on our web page. We also have in rural development, which is sort of the umbrella organization that Rural Utility Service falls under, we have um, an Office of American Indian and Alaska Native Staff. Um, actually, I think that's USDA-wide, and they have just sort of a general email address. If they can't answer your questions, they will find someone who can answer your questions. So those are both good places to start, depending on what angle you want to go from. Next slide. Jessica, we've got several questions about um, SUDA program before we move on to this next segment. And um, so the, the first one, this is a question that came in with the registration. And the question is, what are the areas that are considered SUDA, and is there does USDA maintain a list of the SUDA areas? So USDA does not have a definitive list of SUDA areas, as far as I'm aware. Um, as I said, there are ways to look up based on the statutory definition of trust areas with um, various different groups if the land is considered trust area, uh, a trust area. The um, 
Department of the Interior has maps of uh, tribal lands in the United States. The Department of Hawaiian Homelands maintains, um, you know, maps of of what's considered to be Hawaiian homelands and things like that. And so those have to be looked up through those organizations. And this is a related question that just came in, and I think your answer may have already addressed this, but the specific question is, that, you know, in this case there are several contiguous reservations that are check checkerboarded. So they've got some areas that are trust land, other areas, and many checkerboard, it's, you know, areas that are trust land and then fee land. Sometimes it's trust land, you know, and or allotments, you know, and then other areas that are fee land. And the question is, do eligible trust areas include checkerboarded reservations, you know, the combinations, again, of trust, Indian fee, and non-Indian lands? Um, yeah, so as I said, the, the definition of um, trust area is, is defined in the statute. So um, if you read what it says, um, it just is, um, well, I guess I can't go back to my slide there, but it's, um, yeah, can we go back to that slide? Yeah. Uh, I think it was one of the first one. Yeah. There so is. this is this is specifically the definition of of a trust area. It's these four things. Um, so the short answer to the question, I believe, is yes. Um, and then the proof as to whether it's a trust area is just something like a map from the Department of the Interior. So um, I hope that answers the question. <laughs> okay. And then there's another question about, um, uh, you know, the SUDA funding. And the question is, does a SUDA non-duplication waiver allow for an applicant to build out as a CLEC, a competitive local exchange carrier, in an area that belongs to another ILEC the incumbent local exchange carrier, if that ILEC is already an RUS borrower? And this is a pretty specific question, so you know, if you have a response to that, um, great. And if not, maybe that's something that we can get back to that individual with an answer. So the answer is possibly, um, unfortunately, because it depends on the circumstances of the project. And um, the, the, again, the determination of the RUS administrator. So uh, we can only we can waive that non-duplication only under certain circumstances. So my suggestion would be for an individual that's in that particular predicament to ask their GFR or someone maybe in our loan origination division in the national office um, to comment on that specific project because it's really just going to be different for every situation. Okay, and then two other questions on this general topic. Um, and the first is going back to this definition of trust areas and really, you know, the kind of the interplay between this statutory definition and, and then the broader definition of Indian country that's used in federal law. And so the, the specific question is just simply being, uh, does being a, uh, Indian reservation necessarily mean that it is trust land. Um, and if you want to address that, and then I can chime in with, you know, my thoughts on that as well. Um, yeah, so again, it's just that any land that's held in trust by the United States for Native Americans, um, but in general, yes. Um, most reservations will be considered trust areas. That's right, and it's also going to include um, allotments, which you know, land that's held in trust by the United States, but for uh, specific um, tribal members as opposed to for the tribe as a whole. Right. So there are different types of trust land that would fall under this definition. True. And then the last question on this area is um, a very specific question, but it's one that I wanted to make sure we addressed. And this is also a question that came in with the registration. Um, and the, the question is with regard to U.S. freely associated states. And the question is, you know, the island nations of the Federated States of Micronesia and the Republics of Palau and the Marshall Islands, are they eligible 
for uh, federal telecom grant and grant loan programs, and how does that fit in with with the particular issue of, of SUDA? Right. Um, yes, they are eligible for telecom loans. And um, I believe the uh, last provision on the trust area slide, which is still up, is the one that would apply to those countries. So any island in the Pacific Ocean, if the land is by cultural tradition, communally owned land would be considered trust, a trust area. OK. Thanks. Um, and I might also add that I don't know if there's anyone that wants to know about this, but we also have a list of eligible countries on our website that are eligible for telecommunications program loans as well, besides the United States. Okay, great. And I think that's all of the questions that came in dealing with, uh, you know, the SUDA definition. Okay. Um, Great. So I'm going to take the momentary silence as an opportunity to move on and talk a little bit about the two loan programs specifically. So, um, you know, uh, I'm going to start with a brief history of the telecommunications program. Um, in the 1930s, uh, the Rural Electrification Administration was created um, with a focus on bringing electricity to rural America. At the time, 90% of urban Americans had electricity in their homes, but only 10% of rural Americans did. Um, so it was considered very important by the people who founded it. And then in 1949, um, they received additional authority to fund telephone services for rural America. Um, at that time, telephone service was sort of considered the next most important thing after electricity, and it was considered essential that rural Americans have it. And then in 1995, um, we started requiring all, tele all telecom networks that were funded to be broadband capable. And it was around the same time that the name changed to Rural Utility Services from Rural Electrification Administration. Uh, so that's pretty early for financing um, broadband capable networks. So sometimes we can be a bit ahead of the curve. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but um, especially for people that may have already had interactions with the telecom program in the past, I just want to mention that we have done a reorganization of our division. So in the past, Farm Bill broadband loans were processed by the broadband division and infrastructure loans were processed by either the northern or southern division, depending on what state they were in. It was a geographic divide. So each of those groups, obviously, was following the same regulations and everything, but each one had different people in it and sort of slightly different procedures. Um, we have now changed our organizational structure so that all incoming loans and grants, for that matter, go to the loan origination and approval division. So hopefully this is going to simplify things. Um, every procedure for every loan should be as much the same as it can be. Um, next slide, please. And so we now have a structure that looks something like this. In brief, um, Keith Adams is the head of the telecommunications program, the assistant administrator. And he has um, four deputy assistant administrators. Sammy Zoror uh, works most directly with him. and then. The head of my division, Policy and Outreach, is Ken Kuchno. Um, the Policy and Outreach division handles everything from doing public events such as these to writing regulations to monetary defaults and newsletters, just you know things like that. Um, Sean Arner is head of the Loan Origination and Approval Division. Um, and Peter Amable is the head of our Portfolio Management and Risk Assessment Division. So again, these are all new. Um, it's got all of the same people working in them as you've worked with us before, but they're doing slightly different jobs now. Uh, next slide. So our infrastructure loan program, um, we have $690 million available in that program. It is our, um, our largest program except for the program we had under the stimulus a couple of years ago. And we pretty consistently have $690 million. We've had that same amount for a few years now, but it could change. 
Um, it's designed to target small communities with populations of 5,000 or less. This is a non-competitive program. Applications are accepted year-round, so there's no um, funding window or deadline, so to speak. We continue to give out loans until we, if and until we run out of funding. Um, the interest rates are set at, US, uh, at current U.S. Treasury rates, so we actually have hardship cost of money and guaranteed loans under this program, and the interest rates vary slightly for those three kinds, but I'm not going to go into that much detail right now. Um, and all projects financed under this program must be broadband capable. Uh, next slide. So for this and our other uh, loan program, we can really, any entity that is providing telephone service or, um, in rural areas um, that isn't an individual or a partnership is eligible for this program. Um, you know, basically anything you see on the list here, and you know, you have to be able to enter into a contract with the U.S. government. Next slide. Um, so again, I'm not going to go into too much detail about this. The loan funds for this program can be used for new construction improvements, expansions, and acquisitions and refinancing, but with um, restrictions. That's um, those are only done in pretty specific circumstances. So if you want a lot of details about that, I would talk to your GFR or look at some of the materials we have online. Um, so that's the infrastructure program. And now we'll talk about the Farm Bill program briefly. Next slide. Um, so the Farm Bill program was recently reauthorized under the 2014 Farm Bill. Um, we're actually currently not accepting applications for this program because the 2014 Farm Bill made some changes to the program, and we have to, we're in the process of writing a new regulation. So that regulation is um, going to be out for public comment sometime in the near future. But until we get that finalized, we can accept applications. Um, I believe we have $34.5 million authorized for this year. So hopefully we can at least get um, some of that out, depending on how long it takes to approve the regulation. Um, and because of that, I'm going to go into even less detail here. This is a really great program. And as soon as it's available again, hopefully people will utilize it. But some of the um, details of it are obviously going to change. So um, previously, uh, it was designed to reach communities of 20,000 or less that were not adjacent to an urban area of 50,000 people or more. So that basically means um, no suburbs. It can't be that close to a large city. Um, and then uh, next slide, please. And the eligibility is basically the same here. Uh, no individuals or partnerships, but any other entity that is um, eligible to do have a contract with the United States government is eligible for this program. And uh, again, that's all I'm going to say at the moment about that program, because some of the things are going to be changing. So uh, look out for that reg publication, and you can get your information from that. Um, next slide. So um, this is an important slide, so everyone can you know, wake up from their nap now. Um, and it has, again, the link to all of our general field representatives across the country. Um, it also has my contact information and the number for the Loan Origination and Approval Division. Um, they will, if you have specific questions about a loan that you are putting together, they will probably, um, they will help you as much as they can, but they'll also recommend that you call the GFRs. So uh, they're always a good starting point, but you can call either one. You can call me. Um, we also have the email address for the Rural Development American Indian and Alaska Native Office a second time. And um, finally, I would really encourage people to sign up for our listserv. Uh, we send out email notices, um, and there's three different groups. You can sign up for all telecom programs, or you can sign up just for one of the grant programs or both of the grant programs that we offer. There's going to be a webinar on those in a couple of weeks on November 18th. Um, and we send out, uh, for example, I imagine when the regulation for the broadband program is 
we'll send that out to the listserv. We tend to send out award announcements and things like that. So the link is there. Please sign up for the listserv. It's a good way to stay in the loop. And I think with that, I'm going to turn it over to any other questions that have come up. Yeah, thank you, Jessica. And we do have um, a, several follow-up questions. And as we're addressing uh, the questions that are in queue, just remind everybody, if you do have any questions, go ahead and type those in um, on the GoToWebinar toolbar at this time, and then we will just work our way through these. So, Jessica, the first follow-up question circles back to the um, earlier question. It's echoed by a, a different participant, but relates to the issue about checkerboard reservations. And, um, and the question is that on checkerboard reservations, and actually this applies even in other contexts as well, that the utilities are often on a uh, street or a roadway that is a county road or is, you know, other than trust land, but the land that's served, you know, is, is trust land. Mm -hmm. And so the participant's question is, you know, would that be considered pseudo land or not? Yes, um, if, if the okay. land being served by the project is trust land, is a, is a trust area, and it can be shown to be a trust area, then the headquarters of the, the utility company or the applicant do not have to be on that trust area. Um, in fact, your whole, um, there's, no, there's nothing in the SUDA provision that even says you have to serve at least this much trust area. So if your entire project was on trust land, except for the headquarters, then you're certainly potentially eligible for SUDA considerations. Yeah, and that's, that's very helpful. And I actually pulled up um, when this question came in, and I've got it up on the screen right now. Yep, I've got the it. The definition, yeah, that you had cited to earlier. You've got the citation in your presentation, but it's uh, 7 CFR. 1700.103, and so what is the actual regulation states is that an eligible community is a community that is located on trust land. And so that just reinforces what you just said. The, the key focus is where is the community that's being served located. Correct. And as I mentioned before, um, non-tribal applicants are still eligible for SUDA. So it's just as long as they are serving, at least in part, um, a trust area and can show that. Yeah. Okay. And then the next question is, um, um, would you please discuss how American Indian tribes can request the inclusion of the Community Connect grants in the USDA SUDA provision? All right. Um, so the, the SUDA um, provision was an, an amendment to the RE Act, the Rural Electrification Act, which um, does not cover our grant program. So um, this particular provision, it, it doesn't apply. As far as, um, and, and that's, I, I believe that will probably be talked about in more detail at the November 18th webinar when they'll be discussing um, our grant programs. But yes, these provisions cannot apply to Community Connect or our distance learning and telemedicine program. OK. And um, uh, a related question is, does SUDA apply to infrastructure loans? Yes, uh, these are the two, that's one of the two loans I was just discussing, the infrastructure loans and the Farm Bill Broadband loans. Um, those are our two loan programs, and SUDA applies to both of them. OK. Thanks. And then the next question is um, um, looking for some specific input. It says, when a tribal applicant that is, uh, this is for a tribal applicant looking to fund the construction of a fiber optic backbone to support a reservation-wide wireless network. And the question is, would you su suggest waiting for the 2014 Farm Bill loan program um, because the population served will be over 5,000? Um, this, this is Laurel Leverrier. Um, and first off, thank you for your question. I guess I would just say, if the community for which the applicant is interested in serving is over 20,000, then 
it's not eligible for our infrastructure program, in which case um, the person would have to, you know, the broadband loan program would be its only option, in which case they'd have to wait for that. So if you're looking at serving communities with a population over 5,000 but under 20,000, um, and you're looking for a loan program, our broadband loan program is it. Okay. Um, thanks for that. And then a um, related question on the Farm Bill. It says, how long is the 2014 Farm Bill applicable? That is, how long before the Farm Bill program um, you know, will likely be revised again? And it said, also, is the $34.5 million an annual number, or is that over the life of the Farm Bill? So this is Laurel again. Sorry. Um, I've been working a lot with our Farm Bill program, so I'm getting very excited with all these questions. Basically, the provisions from the 2014 Farm Bill will stay in place until a new Farm Bill is passed. So we anticipate five I years think. from now um, another Farm Bill will come down the pipe, at which point, you know, um, and, and to be clear, the Farm Bill that was passed this time it didn't change everything, it just changed certain things. So, but to answer the question, we anticipate another farm bill to be passed again as a congressional act, it's not us, but we would anticipate probably in five years. Um, and then I just also wanted to add that, as Jessica already noted, we're working very diligently to address the statutory changes and put out a new regulation, and we hope to do that very soon. And in regards to the $34.5 million, uh, for that program, it has to be reauthorized. Or they give us new budget authority every year. So the $34.5 million is just for this year. And then we'll get more or less or something next year. <laughs> OK. Um, and then, uh, Jessica, you had mentioned a couple times that the SUDA provisions are not limited to tribal applicants. Um, we have a question from one of the participants. Um, is there some type of priority or preference for tribal applicants over non-tribal entities uh, that might be applying? And this is in the context of building broadband networks on tribal lands where there might be two entities trying to serve that specific trust area. Um, so what I would say to that is, um, so just like everything with SUDA, the RUS administrator has pretty broad discretion, so ultimately the decision will sort of come down to him or her. But um, if a non-tribal applicant is applying to serve a trust area, as I mentioned, they have to show um, in some way that there is support from the tribe. And so if, if we got into a situation where somehow it was exactly equal, and half the tribe wanted their own tribal utility to build there, and the other half wanted the non-tribal company to build there, we might be in some trouble. I, I can't really envision that happening. Um, so I think that if you're trying to compete with um, a tribal telecom company, unless you can really show that you have just extremely more support for your project, um, it's not going to be that likely. So for that particular case, um, you know, I, I, I wouldn't, I'm not sure that the non-tribal applicant would um, do so well. However, in terms of is there a preference for tribal applicants serving tribal land or trust land versus non-tribal applicants serving trust land, again, that all depends on how many funds we have available, the project itself has to be feasible and all of that. So there's sort of several steps before we even get that far. And then, um, again, the SUDA provisions themselves are applied at the administrator's discretion. So. OK. OK, thanks. And then we've got a, a, um, and I believe this is the last question. So for everyone, we do have some additional time. If you've got another follow-up question, go ahead and type that in um, as we're addressing this question. Um, this question says, you know, can funding be used to connect a SUDA area to a nearby POP, which I believe is point of presence, is that correct, um, in another town to provide either new or improved broadband service? In other words, does it fund more than just last mile service? Yes. Um, it does, and the and in regards to the specifics of a trust area being connected to P, to a POP, as long as they can show that that is 
is needed, you know, that that will improve um, the service to the area, then yeah, that's perfectly fine. Okay. So if you have any, um, if there are other questions, go ahead and type those in um, at this time and uh, we'll see if any others uh, come in. I wanted to circle back to the question that was brought up earlier about utilizing um, you know, um, funds where the applicant has come in and applied under the suitor provision um, and is combining that uh, you know, funding with some other uh, source of funding, whether it's another you know, grant from a different federal agency or um, you know, private foundation grants or other grants or other funding. And is, does that in any way impact with the SUDA program, either positively or negatively, and how does that, um, you know, when you're combining funds, how does that play into, you know, the SUDA program? Um, so what I would say is that um, there's no reason that, um, especially since these are, you know, these are loan programs, there's no reason that there can't be um, other sources of funding. It's just that those have to be detailed in the application. And again, like you have to explain um, what impact if you received SUDA provisions um, that would have on your project. So in terms of combining it with other funding, you know that might be something that needs to be laid out in the application. But um, I, I and we don't have you know it's not like the infrastru infrastructure program is sort of paired with any specific program, but um, there, I, there's no reason in general why there can't be other federal grants or loans associated with the project. Um, it could, however, raise the interest rate on the loan because the lower, um, the, you know, as I mentioned before, the interest rate under SUDA is determined by the, the lowest interest rate necessary to make the project feasible. So if they have outside funding, they might not get the lowest possible interest rate. Okay, and then um, my, I guess my follow-up question on that would be, with, with any of these loan programs, the borrower will need to demonstrate the ability to repay the loan. Um, and how does that impact, you know, having other grant funding come in for the initial, uh, you know, infrastructure development or the initial funding for the project? Does that impact at all your analysis in terms of their ability to ultimately repay the loan? Um, I, I would think n no, because unless they're somehow planning to use the grant funds as part of their repayment, I would say probably not, but I'm not completely sure on that one. Um, that might be a good, again, a, a question, especially if it's about a specific thing, um, if someone has a specific grant in mind for a GFR or for the origination and approval division. Okay, and, and, and then um, a couple, couple additional questions that came in, and um, I'll address a specific one and then the more general one. The specific question is, does SUDA apply, also apply to Title II borrowers, that is the ILEX, the incumbent local exchange carriers? As long as they're serving trust areas, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then the general question, this really just kind of I think circles back to um, really the overarching theme of the presentation, and so I think will be a, a good, um, you know, kind of recap. But the question is: Is there a specific loan program for SUDA, or is SUDA just an add-on to existing programs to lower the cost of borrowing? Um, no, um, yeah. So SUDA is not a loan program itself. It is additional provisions that may possibly be applied to existing loan programs. So if you um, are looking at my presentation later um, and you can check the second or third slide out of my slides, it has a list of the five RUS programs that it applies to. So these, that just means that we can take loans. Yeah, um, that's great. 
uh, maybe for those five. So we can take those loans and we can modify them in certain ways to make it more feasible that um, a land-serving trust area gets more favorable terms and things like that. But there is no extra money or a, or a pseudo loan program where it's only loans that go to substantially underserved trust areas. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks. That's um, a very helpful, like I said, sort of recap. Um, and and I did want to, um, I wanted to circle back really quickly to the previous question. Um, I misspoke a little bit because um, if people are taking on uh, or getting grants from other organizations, um, they actually, they can't use those to repay loans from us. And I think, I didn't mean to, but I might have implied that they could. And mm -hmm. additionally, if, so all that would happen is if they're leveraging other funds, they wouldn't have to borrow as much from us because they'd have other funding sources for the project. So again, there's no reason that that can't happen, but we don't tie those together directly. Okay, yeah, that's, that's very helpful, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, one additional question that came in, we've got uh, just a couple minutes here, um, and this question says, has GFRs been provided training on the suit of provisions as it relates to federal treaty obligations, and maybe you can first speak to what are, who are the GFRs and then address that question. Yeah, um, so the GFRs have had SUDA training, um, but we are planning to do more SUDA training for them in the future. You know, we're always looking to follow up on that um, to make sure that everyone's on the same page. Um, and was there a second part to your question? I'm sorry, I, who are the GFRs? Um, yeah. Well, they are our general field representatives, and again, if you go to the links that I provided, it will have a map by state that shows um, where all of our GFRs are. I don't know if, I'm probably not going to name all 27 of them right now. I maybe could, but I won't try. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but, and which link is it where they'll be able to find, um, the you know, who their contact is? Is that first link on this slide, on slide 25, correct? And I will say that when you pull that up, there's a map of the United States, and you can click on your state. It doesn't always take you directly to the GFR for your state, but it will take you, if you click on Oklahoma, it'll just show you the list of all the GFRs, so you can just look until you see Oklahoma or what have you. So they're all there. Okay. Thanks, and it looks like that's all the questions that we had come in. And um, so, uh, Jessica, thank you very much, and Laurel, thank you for being on the call. We really appreciate uh, your presenting today's webinar. Um, so in just a couple minutes that remain, uh, we'd like to talk just a couple minutes about, the, again, the Tribal Telecom and Technology Com Conference coming up May 4 through 7, 2015. If you go to the website, we've got information that we just posted last week with the uh, keynote speakers, and we're really excited with the lineup of keynote speakers that we have. And then in the very near future, uh, this week or next week, we will be sending out a uh, request for presentations for the breakout sessions. And so if you are interested in presenting on a particular topic at the conference, be sure to, to be looking for that information. And then as Jessica mentioned earlier in the pre presentation, we do have another webinar coming up on November 18th that will also be presented by USDA Rural Development Rural Utility Service, and that focuses on grant funding for broadband and telecom, uh, the Community Connect and Distant Learning and Telemedicine grant programs. We also have a couple programs uh, that we've lined up for early December that we will be uh, posting information on here in the next few days, so be sure and check the website and be looking for the email announcing those information. And then finally, on the website, we also have the archived webinars um, available, and this program also will be uh, posted on the website in the next 24 hours. So again, uh, uh, Jessica, thank you for the presentation, and Laurel for being available on today's call. We thank everybody that listened in on the call, and hope you have a very productive remainder of your day. Thanks, everyone.